hello again. Today I'm going to be reacting to the Unusual Suspects game review of Spyro, hope I'm pronouncing that right, Reignited Trilogy. And this is actually a little different than what I usually do with the Unusual Suspect. As I've said many times, my attitude to when Ross John Fernley puts out a movie review or trailer mashup is I react to it as soon as possible, but I never really reacted to a game review by The Unusual Suspect, and my reason for that is I'm not a gamer, and the most I know about games are for the really old school type, like Atari. That's where my game knowledge is at its best. But for more current games, even stuff that came out when I was a little kid, I am mostly pretty fucking clueless, and since he get, goes into depth with his game reviews on these either current or semi-current games, it feels a little awkward watching him review something that I don't know anything about, because with his film reviews, they're usually stuff that I've seen or was familiar with at some point, and the reason I'm doing a reaction to this one is just because I feel like maybe I should give it a try, even though I don't know anything about what he's going to be talking about, and I might come off like the biggest retard, but I think I should give it a shot, and also, this is the first review that he's done that is sponsored, so I want to see how he does uh, plugging a sponsor, just... Just want to see how he does it, and the most I know about Spyro is I remember I did vaguely recognize um, the purple dragon in the video's thumbnail because there was a commercial I saw back in 2002. I remember a commercial featuring this character where it took place on like a farm with chickens getting frozen and a cow in the air falling down and possibly killing the farmer. Chickens on the run, frozen in their tracks. Hope that purple dragon don't come back. Don't come back. That is my biggest experience with um Spyro and without further ado, let's get into it. This is Spyro Reignited Trilogy, critical review by the unusual suspect. to the online learning community, Skillshare, who are officially my very first sponsor. They're doing a lot to spot the channel, which is hopefully going to mean more videos from me, so stay tuned to the end of the video so you can hear all about them. Anyway, on with the review. Ah, good Spyro games. It's been 84 years. <laughs> okay, 18. Feels like 84. I mean, how much longer am I going to have to wait until I get a good, new Spyro game and... Time to dive right in and... Oh. Right. Yeah. I already beat every level in this remake. I saved every dragon, unlocked every achievement and skill point, collected every gem, orb, talisman, and egg, and even went as... Farest to farm 99 lives just for the thrill of seeing another number counter go up. <laughs> Video games, when you want to give yourself the illusion you're getting shit done. <laughs> go review it now, at least that's a little bit more productive. Cue the music. Not great, but not a bad theme. In the late 90s, early 2000s, and happen to own a PS1, chances are you're pretty familiar with this cool customer. And how I'm not. Went, he sucked ass, but we'll get to that. <laughs> now, platformers and collectathons were pretty dominant during the days of the PS1 and N64, and developer Insomniac gave us three of the best games those genres had to offer 1998 Spyro the Dragon, 1999 Spyro 2 Gateway to Glimmer, or Ripto's Rage if you're not European. And 2000's Spyro. Creepy looking dragon. dragon. I played these games religiously as a kid. The controls were tight, the characters were fun and memorable, collecting shit was gratifying as hell, and the graphics were actually fantastic for the time. But you play them now and, yeah, the 
a little whacking at the mm. polygon department. <laughs> but come on, people, with a certain orange marsupial getting a modern day remake, it was only a matter of I recognize that guy. Purple PlayStation started. Because, like Crash, Spyro went to shit post PS1. Developer Insomniac left to do Rasha and Clank, and Spyro was handed off to inexperienced, time restricted developers and or people who had no clue what they were doing. With buggy releases, games bereft of charm and character designs that got worse and worse and worse. And oh my god, what the fuck did they do to you, man? Right. I think we need to euthanize it. It looks like it has a fatal skin condition. And as such, Aspyro has been pretty dormant for years now. But along now has come a savior in the form of developer Toys for Bob, who have just released a graphical overhaul of the first three classic Spyro games for modern day consoles. This is the Spyro Reignited Trilogy, and we're here today to talk about how this package remake compares to the old games. Because, well, let's say you've never played Spyro before. Are you better off buying this remake? Or is it just more common sense to buy the old games on Virtual Console? Well, let's find out. Number one. I'm a remastered fawn, you dork. So Spyro games aren't too focused on narrative or characters, but let's start off by discussing that aspect of the games anyway. Because characters like Hunter, Alora, Bianca and Spyro himself are chock a block full of personality. And I was dying to see how these retro stars would translate to modern day. First off, Toys for Bob have done a fantastic job with the character designs. Spyro is finally back to the way he should look. Characters like Agent 9, Sergeant mm. Bird and Bianca are extremely faithful to their original designs. And then you've got characters like Alora, Sheila and Moneybags who do look a bit <laughs> different. But that's not a bad thing. Now, initially, I was a little put off by their designs. I mean, Sheila's belt looks like it's going to suffocate her. <laughs> oh, God. And Alora, well, I just found her enlarged pupils and her facial colour scheme a little too different. But after playing through the trilogy, the designs actually grew on me, as their modern look makes them a lot more expressive than they were before. In fact, only one of the major character designs lacked my personal seal of approval. I mean, I get that the professor is a mole, but hiding his eyes like that just looks unsettling. Uh, that's I can save. That's the more creepy. Of the characters I overall found pretty strong. The voice cast, well, I can't sing their praises as much. I mean, I will initially, because a lot of the original voice cast does return. Tom Kenny, most famous mm. as the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, returns as Spyro, and it's so good to hear him in the role again. Tom Kenny is Spyro the Dragon. I mean, did you know they actually got bloody Elijah Wood to voice Spyro once? I mean, I love you, Elijah, but Spyro should not be voiced by fucking Frodo Baggins. <laughs> We've also got Richard Tate and back as Agent 9, who's just as wacky as ever, and Tom Kenny kills it in his more secondary roles. Like, did you know he also voices the Professor and Sergeant Bird too? This man has some unbelievable range. But there's he also does. Lots of changes in the cast, and don't get me wrong, no one does a bad job, but a lot of these new voices just don't hold the candle to the original. Moneybags, in particular, is a bit of a downgrade. In the original Year of the Dragon, voice actor Neil Ross made Moneybags into a riot, lovable, smug arsehole. He was just brilliant. <laughs> what a sucker. Uh, that is, it's a far, far better thing you do today, Spyro, than you have ever done, and, uh, well, so forth, etc. You get the idea. In the new <laughs> case, however, one J.P. Block turns him into more of a stereotypical posh British aristocrat. And he doesn't do a bad job by any stretch of the imagination. But Moneybags was more than just a stereotype. He had his own unique flair of douchebaggery that these new games don't quite nail. Hunter, though, I found to be a bigger step down. In the original games, Greg Berger portrayed him as an immensely likable, fun, lovable dork. Maybe this isn't such a good idea. Bringing a dragon here could just make Ripto angrier. Calm down, Hunter, and stop fidgeting. In the remake, however, mm. Robbie Damon portrays him as more of a skater bro, dude. Whoa, that was sweet. And look, there was another egg in the lizard burrow. Sorry, Hunter is not meant to be portrayed that confidently. 
In fact, I think the developers realized this and had to change some scenes to fit his character better, even if it meant ruining a joke. Take this scene in the original Spyro 2, for example. Hunter, do something quick! Uh, hey, give that back! Well, I tried. Fun moment, right? Well, in the remake, they do this. Hunter, do something quick! Uh, hey! Give that back! <coughs> well, I tried. Ugh, come on, guys. The whole joke there was that he didn't try. How do you screw up a joke that was already made for you? But you know what's weird about Hunter's portrayal? It's that Greg Berger, the original voice actor for Hunter, does actually return to voice characters in this game. Yeah, they just had him voice Ripto and gave Hunter's voice acting duties to the same guy who voiced Prompto in Final Fantasy XV. I don't know why they did this. My best theory is that Greg Berger was asking for too much money and they only had enough to pay him for the limited Ripto lines. Regardless, Berger is missed in the role. But where the voice cast I thought really tanked were with all the portrayals of the various world's inhabitants. You know, all the more minor characters you meet in each world. Take these fun little ice cabin guys in the original games, for example. Spyro, the ice wizard, has imprisoned our leader, Shaman Top. Can you Would help you? us rescue him? It is urgent. He has our tickets to the night hockey game in Colossus Valley. And listen to how they sound now. Spyro! The Ice Wizards have imprisoned our leader! Ugh, God, that's <laughs> awful! What the hell did you guys do, robbing some random intern you had around the office to do that voice? God, how many voice actors do we have to hire for this damn thing? Billy, get over here! <laughs> yes, boss? Here, read this line in your best growly voice. But, but I'm not a voice actor. Read it or you're fired. Oh, uh, 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 Spyro! The Ice Wizards have imprisoned our leader. Sure, that'll do. Get him in the booth. Wow. I'll take Must be uh, from the Chris Rock school of voice days. acting. I thought the Yeti was tougher than that. I guess he was all bark. Ro -ro. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Idiot. Okay, <laughs> but let's now have them sound more like stereotypical monks. I thought the Yeti was tougher than that. I guess he was all bark. Ro -ro. You see how you need a more cartoony voice for that line of work? Or what about Sheila's good companions? Here's the original. Last time we tried to get past this moose, he knocked Billy clean for a wall. <laughs> I fucking love that line. Indian? <sighs> but here's the remake. Last time we tried to get past this moose, he knocked Billy clean through a wall. Might be Indian. Yeah, not doing it for me. I seriously could go on and on here. Most NPCs are severely lacking the charisma and quirkiness they had in the originals. But regarding the subpar voice work, it honestly made me wish there was an option in the menu to switch to the old voice cast. Who knows, maybe a talented fan might make that a more someday. Oh, and the overall direction of the game's cutscenes also make this remake a lot more kid-friendly, which I think is a bad thing. Take Ripto, for instance. In the old games, he was goofy, of course, but he occasionally had more menacing moments, which I think made him a better villain, and therefore made you more fun to fight him. Now, he's pretty much all played for laughs, and I don't think it fits. But to each his own, maybe kids of today might prefer this new approach. Anyway, let's, uh, glide on over the gameplay. Number two. The adventure begins... again. <laughs> Spyro 1 through 3 are relatively basic platformers in the same vein as 3D Mario, Crash Bandicoot, and Banjo Kazooie. But Spyro is unique in that he can pull off a charge attack, which doubles as a sprint button, he can breathe fire, and more importantly, he can glide, which makes the platforming experience here something you won't find anywhere else. Now, the remake changes nothing in terms of gameplay, but the controls have thankfully been modernized. You see, the PS1 games didn't make full use of the analog stick. So Spyro was limited to only eight directions, which for a 3D platform game wasn't ideal. But now we have two thumbsticks to use. The left controls Spyro, the right controls the camera. This makes controlling Spyro an absolute joy. I mean, I, I guess that is a weird praise to give a game in 2018. This control scheme is just standard now. But no more than me. The best 
best reason to play the new games over the old ones. Now, to accommodate for the slightly different control scheme, Spyro's flame attack can now be pulled off with one of the shoulder buttons, which is something I made full use of as it allowed me to have Spyro use his flame attack while I was controlling the camera at the same time. This is kind of similar to how racing games have evolved. If you play a racing game in the days of PS1 and 2, you used X to accelerate. Now racing games have moved accelerate to R2. Moving more function to the shoulder buttons in games has been a welcome evolution of game control, and the Reignited Trilogy has made good use of that. Though I would have liked it had they moved the jump button to the shoulder keys as well, as then you would barely ever have to move your right thumb in between the analog stick and the major four face buttons. But that's just a nitpicky suggestion. Okay, let's now talk about gliding, as there's two things I wanted to mention. You see, in Spyro 2 and 3, Spyro has the ability to hover at the end of its glide to get some extra distance. The original Spyro 1, though, didn't have that, and Toys for Bob have chosen not to incorporate it into the respective remake. But to compensate, Spyro has this new ability where if he just misses a glide, he'll automatically hop over the ledge. This is a nice new feature for Spyro 1, and it saved my eyes a few times. But regarding the hover mechanic, this is one Looks of the new games that doesn't control as well. You see, in the old games, the very second Spyro enters a glide, he can hover immediately, which came in handy for shorter gaps. In the new games, though, the hover has a time lock, where Spyro has to have been gliding for at least a second before he can pull off a hover. For if you attempt to hover too soon, Spyro will just drop out of the glide. This took a while to get used to, and I ended up getting a little frustrated with it. Timer it shit was always was annoying when I... But once you adapt, I tried playing a game. Then once you start playing Spyro 3, I did try playing a few play games when I was little and Sheila, Sergeant didn't, the ben phase didn't last Ancient long. Nine. Now Sergeant Bird and Ancient Nine control great as the new controls modernize their movements rather effectively. Sheila and Bentley though suffer a bit more. You see Spyro in this game feels lighter than before which makes controlling him a dream. But Sheila, for some reason, felt much heavier. Her kick attack has seriously been nerfed in the range department, and she's just not as free-flowing in her movement as I'd have liked. And Bentley, well, his controls aren't bad, but why is his camera now off sensor? Because it wasn't like that before. I mean, I did get used to it, but it felt really off at first. Wasn't a fan of this. Okay, so we've discussed gameplay, but this is a graphical remaster, so let's actually get to what matters most here. Number three, trouble with the frame rate, eh? So as privy to the gameplay you've already seen, this goes without saying. This remaster does a fab job of updating Spyro to the modern day. Everything from enemies and collectibles to the levels themselves are bursting with color and detail. Hell, some of the more unfamiliar levels, despite being faithfully recreated, had me like... <laughs> Toys for Bob didn't skimp out on the little details. Look how Spyro's flame burns the grass around him. Look how vibrantly chests and vases smash up and all. How Spyro's tail brushes the grass as he stands still. That's it's good detail. detail like this that adds up. The lighting work is spectacular too. Spyro's flame being quite aesthetic in this regard as it lights up nearby walls and objects as you use it. Oh, and the draw distance, as you'd expect, is much better. I sometimes would look off in the distance and think to myself, Wow, I, I couldn't see that far before. All this extra detail is fantastic. So much so that the game's longer loading times didn't bother me that much, as I would usually take this opportunity to check what the Xbox achievement was for the upcoming level. Hell, even a weird glitch as a level loaded more just fascinated me than anything. <laughs> so, yeah, can't fault the graphics. The frame rate, on the other hand, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not awful, but occasional slowdown is noticeable, and in a game that's all about remastering all the titles, of which had zero frame rate issues themselves, by the way, yeah, that's a problem. I should not be experiencing better performance out of a 24 year old 32 bit system. Now, I honestly feel like Toys for Bob went a little overboard with the graphics. True, the game looks stunning, but if the frame rate has to take a hit, well, it's not worth it then, is it? 90% of gamers are more than happy to forego texture and lighting quality if it means a smoother gaming experience. Like, you know how PC games have graphics settings galore, so you can adjust texture quality for a higher frame rate? 
Yeah, why don't console games have that? I mean, some do, but it should be a standard feature by now. What harm could go from it? It'd be especially nice if this game is then we could remove the rather excessive motion blur. Now, this has split players quite a bit. Some aren't affected at all, but a lot of people, myself included, found it a little jarring to the eyes. It's clear they've added this to try to mask the low frame rate, but as a result, it's apparently causing some players to experience some light motion sickness. Come on, Toys for Bob, just release a patch that allows us to switch off the motion blur. How hard could that be to implement? Maybe a roller coaster would help. Soundtrack? Well, if like me, you played these games as a kid, these songs will forever be ingrained in your mind. Seriously, Stuart Copeland essentially wrote the soundtrack to my childhood. Whether it be the oddly futuristic beat of the fireworks factory. The memorable flute melody of Frozen Altars. It's cute. Nothing special, but cute. The downright zen feeling you get from many of the home worlds. That's the shit right there. And remember when I wished there was an option to switch back to the old voice cast? Well, they've actually made that feature for the music. Up into the options menu and you can switch between the original and reignited trilogy soundtracks as you see fit. And this is a welcome addition, though I never personally employed it here. Why? Well, because of the new dynamic music feature. Now, I don't know if other games have used this, but all games now should. You see, the music in the Reignited Trilogy adapts to the environment Sparrow is in by changing things like reverberation and volume. Pay close attention. Notice the change in sound as Sparrow enters and exits a building. This is really cool and is especially noticeable with headphones, of which I always personally use when gaming. It just makes the music feel more part of the world, as opposed to it just feeling overlaid on the game. More games need to start doing this, it's a really neat and immersive feature. But here's the thing that bothers me most about this remake. True, it's incredibly faithful to the originals, but it's also incredibly faithful to the originals. <laughs> Let me explain. Number four. They not any new features clean through a wall. <laughs> doing a by the numbers remaster of a game is that any issues plagued by the old versions are still prevalent in the new one. First off, there's the boss battles. Now in Spyro 2 and 3, they're fine, but the ones in the first game are awful. You just follow them a bunch of times and flame them when there's an opening. They're just so easy and whilst that was fine for 1998, now it's a tad unacceptable. Toys for Bob could have updated them, but they chose not to. Secondly, there's the various mini-challenge missions. Now, Spyro 1 was lacking in those, but Spyro 2 introduced NPCs with various objectives to introduce some more gameplay variety. Tasks include things like blame all these lamps before the timer runs out, win this game of hockey, or fend off enemy waves. And some of these objectives can definitely be fun, like the skateboarding minigames, for instance. But so many are just a downright chore to play. I think the worst one is found in the spooky swamp level in Spyro 3, where you have to stomp mushrooms as Sheila to make way for these two guys carrying bombs. It just turns into a horrendous game of trial and error, and it is ungodly boring. This mission should have been updated. Hell, it would have been better if it was just removed. Then you got that fucking alchemist in Fracture Hills, whose escort mission turns into yet another trial and error fast as you charge <coughs> at these big stone dudes where you try to find out where the hell this fawny fuck is gonna go. Quick tip, by the way, don't do this mission until you've learned how to head bash, otherwise you'll have to do it twice. Then you have this asshole in Zephyr, who wants you to return these cow things to a pen, but charging and blaming these buggies to where you want them to go will surely test your patience. Or what about that shitty boxing minigame? Toys for Bob could have updated it, maybe turn it into a light punch out <laughs> the same as before. You just smash buttons and hope for the best. It's shit. Then there's the 
What ton of fly through the rings missions? There is an alarming amount of them. And when your game starts to resemble a certain notorious N64 release, I saw Chris you know Stuckman's video on this. And while Looks fucking this terrible. Do with an update. I think what would have helped Spyro adapt to modern day more is more rewards. You see, Spyro games are huge collectathons. Collecting shit is what you spend about 90% of the game doing. And as such, players should be rewarded for their gathering efforts. And look, you are to an extent collect enough gems and you get to unlock some more levels and then there's that certain unlock you get at the end of Spyro 2 which I don't want to spoil but this is 2018 why not give us some more goodies like new clothing items for Spyro for example I want to play through the game with those sweet shades on or maybe if you collect enough gems you can pay to get your charge speed increased or your flame attack get more range or maybe you can unlock that ice breath you get in frozen altars and as such you could use it in every That's where level. the frozen chickens came on from. On with unlock ideas. Gather enough gems and you can unlock the following. The ability to switch between all the new graphics on the fly. Special behind the scenes featurettes where you can see what went into making the game. Newly designed levels not in the original releases. Treat us a bit guys. There's just no notable unlocks here and it makes collecting all these gems feel Kinda pointless, especially in the first game as they do literally nothing. Well, okay, apart from a secret bonus level. But guess what? This stage has you doing nothing but collecting you pet more gems, of which truly have zero use. You're left with 14,000 gems at the end of the game, and you're like... Yay, I guess. <laughs> the only new unlocks that Toys for Bob have added are related to the expanded skill point missions. Complete enough of them and you get to unlock artwork fascinating hell it's not even concept art where you can see rejected designs of characters for example no it's just drawings of characters you could easily find through a quick google image search i was just so desperate for something new here in fact when i beat spyro one my heart jumped a beat when i found this door in the first home world it's just behind where you start, and if you charge into it, it actually moves. What's in here? There's gotta be something. Or is this dog gonna be the new Mew truck where everyone's convinced there's something there, but there actually isn't? Ugh. Toys for Bob have just been so unwilling to change anything. So much so that the various appearances of Zoe giving me tutorials on the game's controls are all still here. Yes, Zoe, I think I know how to glide by now. Cross-eyed much? Teach me about Sparks' gem-finding ability. Yeah, while Zoe tells me that large enemies can't be charged for the 20 millionth time, what I <laughs> didn't know when starting to play was that by holding down R3, Sparks will point to the nearest treasure. Why you no <laughs> tell me that, Zoe? That would have been a welcome bit of information to know after my 40th round trip of Stonehill looking for that last gem. But <laughs> screw that. you got far more useful advice to give. To quickly center the camera behind you, tap the center camera button. To center camera, use the center camera button. Gotta get my good side. I know that was dumb. But if I may defend uh, the football for a moment, the Reignited Trilogy does actually retail at a reduced cost. And considering you're getting three games in one here, yeah, I, I shouldn't be too hard on it. As much as I wish they had added some extra elements. Like, have you ever noticed how in Spyro 2, there are several interactions between Spyro and Richter, but in Spyro 3, Spyro and the Sorceress never say a word to each other. Yeah, why not add a cutscene just before you face the Sorceress so she and Spyro could have a much needed interaction? You could do the same thing with Nasty Knock too. Or in Spyro 2, notice how there's summer, autumn and winter themed homeworlds, but there's no spring one. How cool would it have been if Toys for Bob gave us a whole new homeworld to explore built from the ground up? One that maybe you unlock at the end of Spyro 2, which could be designed around the use of that 100% power-up unlock, so you'd actually have somewhere to use it. Then there's the Speedways, and for a game that debuts on two consoles with expansive online capabilities, why aren't there any online leaderboards? The Crash remake had that, so why not here? Look, I'm at a loss, I don't know what he's talking about here. Years to think about this, so don't think words are toys for Bob for not including all my ideas. I'm just salty because I waited almost two decades for this game to come out, and I managed to beat it in <laughs> just a few days. <laughs> anyway, let's conclude. Make no mistake, the Spyro 
Spyro Reignited trilogy is truly a must play for Spyro fans, and it serves as a fantastic gateway for newcomers. Yes, I'm recommended any new players forgo the old games and start with the remake. Now, sure, some aspects of the games haven't aged too well, but honestly, what games from the 90s do hold up perfectly? The new controls breathed new life into the gameplay, the graphics are wonderful, albeit hampered by the occasional frame rate drop, and just Damn, it's still good to have new life injected into one of my fondest childhood game franchises. My time spent with the Reignited Trilogy was just pure nostalgic bliss, and I'd be more than happy if Toys for Bob decided to remaster more classic games of the past. Now, it's difficult to work out a good score for a remaster, but I'm gonna go with my gut feeling and give the Spyro a Reignited Trilogy an 8. I truly would have liked to have seen more added, some extra features or levels perhaps so returning players could have some more surprises. You know you enjoyed it. But I think that's indicative of my next wish, that Toys for Bob return to Spyro in the near future and give us a true Spyro 4. The Reignited Trilogy has apparently been selling pretty well, reaching number one in the UK sales chart upon release. So I think the interest is there. Or maybe seeing as how Toys for Bob were involved in the development of the Crash Insane Trilogy, why not truly partner up with Vicarious Visions and give us that next-gen Spyro Crash crossover that fans have been wanting for years? Dare I dream? Thanks so much for watching, guys. But you know what else I dare dream of? Being able to make YouTube videos full-time. And that might be super possible thanks to today's incredible sponsor, Skillshare. Oh, I nailed that segue. Skillshare is an online learning community with class numbers that reach, uh, what's a good technical unit of measurement to use here, um, a crap load. With classes in design, technology, business, and here's a personal use of mine, video editing. Yep, there's extensive classes on the Adobe suite of programs. And despite me having years of video editing experience, I'm still learning new things with Skillshare. That is awesome! <laughs> that it is. Premium membership gives you unlimited access to high quality classes from actual experts working in their fields. So you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. Skillshare is also more affordable than most learning platforms out there, with an annual subscription costing less than 10 bucks a month. Cracking value if I do say so myself. And for the first 500 people to sign up via the link in the description, you'll get two months of Skillshare Premium for absolutely free. For free! <laughs> for free. Skillshare, you'll learn so much you'll find that past you as an absolute dumbass. And I've been serious about Skillshare making YouTube much more feasible full time, so I want to give a personal thank you to them for sponsoring me. Much love. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Peace out. <laughs>
I like this a lot. I don't want to keep repeating myself, just I enjoyed it and hopefully my reaction wasn't too awkward or retarded despite my lack of knowledge on the game and most gaming stuff in general and love Ross and as always I look forward to whatever video he puts out next.